So um, our program is called Signs of the Seasons. It's a New England phonology program. I'll get into a little bit more about what that means in my presentation in a moment. But really it's about monitoring seasonal biological changes which are linked to our changing climate. So this is session one of three, our introduction. Um, and Esperanza and I um, have been working together on this since um, 2010. Going to find my next. So the reason for this program, um, where we're looking at how um, plants and animals are responding to climate change is of course, the changing concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And just to kind of orient ourselves before we get, get going on the biological side, um, to look at the carbon dioxide data, many of you have seen graphs like this before. What this is showing is it's reconstructing historical CO2 levels for the last 400,000 years using ice cores. Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, has produced these data. And what it shows are that you had oscillations in um, CO2 concentrations over those last 400,000 years, but starting in around 1950 is when things really started to change more quickly and that number just started going up exponentially. And so um, since late 2014, um, that concentration has been over 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. And um, the most recent data I have on this slide is from 2018. Um, where it was at 400, almost 411 parts per million. And Esperanza has just shared with me that um, the most recent year we have data for last year, it was around 412. So it is still creeping upwards. And so what that does is it affects our globe, of course, as, as we're, you know, is, is in the news a lot. But what's interesting and is that it doesn't affect the globe equally in all places and it doesn't even affect our country equally in all places. Um, and so, and beyond that, it doesn't affect our country in the same ways in different seasons. And so this slide is from um, a really great data, climate data visualization organization called Climate Central. And it shows that in the winter and in the fall, um, we're actually having much more pronounced changes in our part of the country um, than you get in the spring and the summer. And so you look at these, the, the darker colors um, correspond with greater changes in degrees Fahrenheit per decade. And so the dark, darkest color you see here is um, 1.2 degrees change. And so in New England, where we are, that change is much more dramatic than it is in the southwestern United States, for example, in the winter. And so we think of the south, southeastern US as being very hot and sticky, but it's actually not warming as quickly as it is here in the northern part of this, um, the country in the winter and in the fall, and in the west, in the west, in the southwest, in the spring, in the fall. Sorry, I'm, my pause is that I'm used to using my arrows. And so of course, when it comes to the growing season, those of you who are gardeners will have noticed likely that we have an, um, an increasing number of frost-free days. And those we partic particularly notice those this time of year, but also in the fall. And in Maine, we have on average um, add 10 additional frost-free days um, for the period between 1986 and 2015 as compared to the period between 1901 and 1960. Um, and so that's about a week and a half of change. And when we, when we look at a different kind of map, this is a plant hardiness zone map, which is produced by the USDA. Um, the, those among you who are gardeners may be familiar with this, but um, we use these, these codes down here in the lower right to understand what kind of plants will thrive in the areas where we are. And what they update this map every decade, and it's each decade it's based on data from the previous three decades. And so the most recent um, period of time when this map was created was for the period from 1980 to 2010. And this map was it takes a couple of years to analyze all the data. So this map on the right here, the one in color, was um, released in 2012. And what it shows, which is really interesting, and you can't see the colors on this previous map. Um, but this light green zone here, which is zone 6A, and it is before this was more typically associated with central Massachusetts and Connecticut, 
um, it showed up in Maine for the first time. And so you can really see these changes in color when you're presented in this way. And the previous, in the previous version of this map, zone 5B was the warmest we had experienced in Maine. And so um, warming, our warming climate and that increased CO2, which of course traps heat in our atmosphere, um, really produces a whole range of ecological impacts. So as a result of climate change, species and ecosystems are experiencing changes in their ranges that they're able to live, um, the timing of their biological activity, growth rates, relative abundance of species, cycling of water and nutrients um, through the earth and ecosystems, and the risk of disturbance from things like fire, insects, and invasive species um, has increased. But what we're really focusing on here for this Science of the Seasons program is the timing of biological activity and this, um, especially the seasonal changes um, that species, plants and animals go through. And so the definition of phenology is recurring plant and animal life cycle stages like flowering, reproduction, leaf fall, migration, and hibernation, and specifically the timing of when those changes are occurring on a seasonal scale. Phenology is important because um, plants and animals are very sensitive to those very small changes in the climate over time and also in the weather in the shorter time frames. And those changes affect the ways that plants, animals, and people interact with each other, including humans, and on a larger scale with ecosystems. So the photos that you have here show pollinators pollinating. Um, Monarch butterfly, this is a monarch um, showing that it can feed on things like purple loosestrife. This is an invasive species, but when it comes to the caterpillars, they really um, rely on having milkweed species available because the, the cat monarch caterpillars can only feed on milkweed. Um, and then we have sugar maples, which is of course so important for our maple syrup production, um, but also just our culture and our economy here in Maine. Um, and this little boy enjoying an apple just to um, show how important the apple seasons and festivals are to really every aspect of our life, especially in a resource rich um, and economically driven, um, a resource driven economy like we have here in Maine. And so this is a uh, um, this linkage between humans and our environment and this phenology, the seasonal timing of biological changes has been around since humans have been making their way on earth. Um, and I, I really like to find um, examples of phenology in unexpected places. And so this is a really sweet nursery rhyme from one of my kids books. Um, it's called A Swarm of Bees in May, and I'll just read it to you. A swarm of bees in May is worth a load of hay. A swarm of bees in June is worth a silver spoon. A swarm of bees in July is not worth a fly. And so that's another way of saying that you need to have your pollinators available at the times when the plants are flowering, because if they're not able to pollinate, then you won't get a good crop. And so if your swarm of bees is available too early before you have flowers, like in May, you might get a little uh, production that year, worth a load of hay. If your swarm of bees is available in June when you really need them, it's worth a silver spoon because you'll get a great crop. But if your swarm of bees doesn't arrive until July when all the flowers are passed, it's not worth a fly and you'll have a terrible crop that year. So um, it's presented in this kind of friendly rhyme, but it was very serious business and still is for, um, for lots of different parts of our economy and culture. And so another way to think about this and show it is that um, this is an activity that we would, we would have done in person had we been meeting for our training as we had planned, um, where we ask participants in our trainings to think of changes that they notice happening in each of the months of the year. And so these are just, um, just a subsection of those. And, but what Esperance and I really enjoy about this activity is that depending on where in the state we are and also who's attending, those things change. And so we each have kind of our own phenology calendar of things that we notice or that we particularly care about and they're very meaningful to us. So for example, I would have definitely put strawberries in June and um, blueberries in, in August. But if we were um, meeting with somebody for whom strawberries were earlier, so if we had our, our training in Virginia, for example, those would be much earlier. Or if we were meeting um, way up in the county in Northern Maine, you might have a lot of these things appearing at different times. 
But this activity also shows that not only do we notice different things or different things are important to us, um, but they move around from year to year. And so one year you might have um, sugar snap peas um, happening earlier and one year later, depending on the weather. And so that interannual variability is really important in how these things happen. And what's really important about phenology is being able to track this year over year so you can build up a long-term trend and understanding about how these changes are happening in response to climate change. And so you might ask, if, it's so, if this is so important, why hadn't I heard of phenology before? Um, and there's a great reason for that. Um, uh, scientists like Aldo Leopold and Sarah Elizabeth Jones have been studying phenology for a very long time. But at the time when they were doing this work, which is in the um, 1930s in Wisconsin, they were cataloging the timing of when what you're looking at right now is across the, um, the, the top, you're seeing the, the growing season, the months of the year. Um, and each one of these little tiny arrows is the name of a flower. And the length of the arrow and the timing of where it appears shows when that flower was in bloom. And so what Aldo Leopold and Sarah Elizabeth Jones were doing is that they were cataloging the bloom times of all these flowers in this particular marsh and they were able to do it once and publish it and then it was considered a reference going forward and so that was the study of phenology it was um, trying to record it make your observations record it and then it would serve as a reference but what we're finding is that um, if we were to go back and try to recatalog all the species in this particular marsh now they would have moved around a lot. Different species respond in different ways to climate change and changes in the weather at, at a shorter time scale. And so we're finding it's a much more dynamic science um, than people at that time realized. And so now is, is a time of particularly rapid change as we showed in that first graph. And so for example, in Concord, Massachusetts, we can find archival photos of um, a pink lady slipper in bloom and on the 19th of June back as far as 1917. Um, and then we have this photo from May of 2005 where it's blooming in, on the 17th of May. And so that's much, much later. And I was just in contact earlier today actually with a photographer who lives in Texas but has taken wonderful photos of, from Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. And he had taken photos of lady slippers from much more recently. And so I'm trying to update our photo, but it just shows that even though there's a change from year to year, you would never see a pink lady slipper blooming as late as June 19th um, in Concord, Massachusetts anymore. And so those kinds of efforts can show based on historical records. And what we really need is some baseline data moving forward so that researchers can use it to understand how things are changing. And so Concord, Massachusetts is very fortunate. This is a photo of a, a statue of Henry David Thoreau outside um, reproduction of his cabin on Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. And they're so fortunate because he spent um, a long time cataloging the blooming times of over 500 native species in that area in the 1850s. And so they have a rich historical record to refer to as a baseline. And many other places aren't so fortunate to have that rich historical record. And so what we're doing right now is we're trying to create that baseline data with our Signs of the Seasons program. These data have existed in log books and notebooks for um, as long as people have been writing notes, farmers and fishermen, um, but also naturalists um, who just have taken an interest in uh, make, marking down the observations of things changing. My mom actually uh, marks down every day on her calendar what species of plants and animals that she sees um, around their house in Vermont. And this is another photo of another woman named Kathleen Anderson who lives in Middleborough, Massachusetts. And she had um, 50 years of data like this from her farm. And some researchers at Boston University asked her if they could record, um, di digitize all of her data and analyze it to, to try to understand how things have changed. And she was very grateful for that offer because when you're writing it down and you're looking at very small changes and, and you get the noise of a warm spring and a cool spring, it's really hard to see those long-term trends. But what they found when they digitized all of her data was that um, things like wood ducks were arriving back to her farm on average three weeks earlier than they did when, when she first started taking her records. So that's the power of being able to analyze the data and really, and, and, 
taking uniform observations over time. And so researchers have identified phenology as perhaps the sim simplest process in which to track changes in the ecology of species in response to climate change. This was a quote from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from two back in 2007. And that sort of public statement and recognition of this fact really spurred a, a huge explosion in programs just like ours, um, monitoring phenology of all different species across the country, but also around the world. Um, and so Esperanza was on sabbatical in 2008, um, nine, and met with some of the researchers who were really doing this work. And, and when she came back to Maine after that, um, she and I started working to develop this program. Um, we're really proud to be, um, have, this is our 10th year of d data that we're collecting. Um, and we've been working closely with researchers and other similar programs all across the country to make sure that our data um, can be directly compared with what their, their um, programs in other places so that we can help contribute to this larger body of work. And so on the whole, really what this does is it helps us make better decisions about what science um, should get priority for funding, um, how to make um, public health planning decisions, things like tick-borne illnesses are especially important and mosquito-borne illnesses as as things start heating up and fortunately not here yet as much, but things like um, equine encephalitis is an example, hopefully of, hopefully not of worse things to come. Um, how to make decisions in terms of conservation planning, things like when to, to mow fields to avoid ground nesting birds, for example. All of these things, of course, play into our economics, um, in, and especially in a place like Maine but also um, our recreational and cultural values and the hunting and fishing and tourism that really um, drives a lot of this, our activities here in Maine. Um, and so the bottom line is really that phenology is changing, that different species are changing differently, and that has big implications for plants, animals, and people. And we really need more information than we have right now. Um, and so the Science of the Seasons program, we started, as I said, um, in 2010. We had our first season of volunteers working in 2011, and we've been working with a number of partners all over the state. Um, the institutions that you can see here, Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, Maine Audubon, Maine Maritime Academy, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, Squiddick Institute, um, and also New Hampshire Sea Grant and Cooperative Extension. Um, but the other logo there, the one that says USA MPN, is the USA National Phenology Network, which is based in Tucson, Arizona. And they are the primary national partner that we work with, and they house all of our data in a database that we'll be sharing in detail in, in our next sessions. The objectives of our program are both to increase climate literacy of citizens in Maine and New Hampshire through observing and recording the local effects of climate change, but also to contribute meaningful data to researchers and resource managers who are trying to understand and adapt to the local effects of climate change. And I'll go through a few ways that folks are using our data already. We have 22 indicator species and we've purposefully identified a relatively small number of species so that we can concentrate our observations on species that are important both culturally and for our economy, but also as indicators of climate change. And we spread out our observations across um, birds, amphibians, um, plants, trees, and flowers, um, and also the monarch um, as our insect species. They include five calibration plant species, which were identified by the National Phenology Network um, because they're located all across the US, um, species such as red maple and dandelions. And so an observation in Maine of a dandelion can be um, directly compared with an observation um, in Wisconsin or California of a dandelion. And so that's a very powerful tool for looking at changes across the whole un United States landscape. And we also monitor one intertidal species, um, Ascophyllum nidosum, which is more commonly called rockweed, um, which is important for its ecological contributions, um, but it's also, it grows from the mid-Atlantic all the way up until Greenland. And so the timing of its reproductive phase is um, a really great indicator of how coastal waters are warming. So through the program, we offer training such as this one. Um, we also provide resources to support um, the observation. 
and we do um, we work with scientists throughout Maine and also in other parts of the country to analyze our data and give presentations about their work and the ways that this program is contributing to the greater body of knowledge about how climate change is affecting um, the timing of local phenology here in Maine. Um, this across the bottom here is our website and we'll follow up the training with a link to the website with for some more information. This is a screenshot of the USA National Phenology Network's website. And as I said, the database that we use, that they house and maintain it, which is a wonderful partnership because it's very um, sophisticated and it's very easy to use. Um, and they share that um, for free with organizations all over the country. Um, here's another photo of the Nature's Notebook database and we'll be kind of walking you through step by step for how to use that. There's also a mobile app for making observations and we'll go through in detail how to do that, but I just wanted to flag for you now that it's very easy to make observations when you're out in your yard or your field um, and it all syncs automatically into the database. Um, you can either do it with a computer after the fact um, from paper data sheets, um, but the mobile app is another way to just make it seamless. This is um, a I need to update this slide, but it's a visualization of where our sites are. We have sites in every county in Maine. Um, we actually have more than this now, um, um, but it, and they closely follow where our population centers are, of course, um, and there's room for many more observers. The darker dots represent a higher concentration of, of species, um, but it's really powerful to be able to compare a site in Presque Isle, for example, with one in Wells, um, because we have so many different climate zones in Maine. So just a few, a little bit of an overview on um, what species um, we're observing and is contributing to research. As I mentioned, the rockweed study, we're working with um, Jessica Mullen at Maine Maritime Academy to look at the timing of the reproductive phase in rockweed. Um, our red, red and sugar maple observations and lilacs, the National Phenology Network is doing nationwide studies of the advancing um, onset of spring. And I'll show you a visualization in a moment. And also we're working with Maine Audubon to look at changing loon phenology over time. So for example, the kinds of questions that we can ask and answer through studying phenology is, um, so for example, the loon population, uh, the population of adults has been going up steadily over time, um, but the population of chicks has remained steadily low and um, the biologists at Maine Audubon have been trying to understand better at what point um, are the chicks most vulnerable? And how can we protect the chicks better so that more of them um, survive? Because you would think that you would have more chicks if you have more adults, but what they're guessing is that there are either um, fewer breeding pairs or that fewer of their chicks um, in those more adult pairs are surviving to adulthood. And so the question you can ask is when are lone chicks most vulnerable and how can phenology help? Um, and so our data, this is what you're looking at here, are different phenophases, which is when different things are happening. Um, uh, across the bottom, you see when, those are all the observations of when individuals were active. Um, and then, but with phenology, you can actually isolate the timing of when the nests are occupied, which is what the top line is, when you start to see the first downy feathered young, and when you have the fledged young. And what they're guessing is that those occupied nest and the downy young times are the highest vulnerability. And so they're thinking about ways to protect the young during that phase. And these observations at different parts of the state can really help the biologists there. And this is just another way of looking at those data, but one year to the next, the last slide was only looking at um, one year, but this is a way you can compare one year to the next and you can see um, the clusters of data, this on the uh, y-axis here, you're looking at the day of the year from January at the bottom all the way up to December at the top. And so you're seeing the timing of the active individuals. But in 2017 and 2018 were the first years that we had um, the National Phenology Network had updated their data set to include the chicks. And that's what you see in the red, brownish red marks here. Um, and so the active adult timing doesn't tell us as much as when we know when the chicks are there too. 
So you can see that. And our goal is to build up a long-term data set um, in many different parts of the state so we can get as much data as possible. Another type of question you could ask is, is spring getting earlier in Maine? Um, and so this is where our red maple, um, the timing of our breaking leaf buds can, can tell us a lot for how things change from one year to the next. So in this graph, um, you're looking at the number of, of yes observations for breaking leaf buds on the y axis and on the x axis you're looking at the months of the year. And so the blue line is a, a later year that was 2018 we had a late a cooler later spring and um, some of you will remember in 2012 we had a very warm year with 80 degrees in March and so we had almost a month earlier um, we had breaking leaf buds of red maples in 2012 compared to 2018. And so that's just a way, one way that we can visualize the data, but over time you can get many different years and set a trend line to those changes. This is just another way of looking at that. Um, this is the time of red ma maple leaves um, from one year to the next since 2011. We need to add our, our last two years of data to this slide. But this, these are box and whisker plots where you have 50% of each year's of data in, inside this little box. This is the mean or the, the average of each year. And then these whiskers show the um, latest observation and the earliest observation. And so this kind of a graph shows not only on average when these, how these changes. So this is later, earlier, later, later, later. Um, but this is that 20, uh, 2012 very early on average, um, but it also shows how much variability you have between the earliest observation and the latest. Um, just a couple more of these and then we'll wrap up. Um, this is the National Phenology Network spring casting site where um, this is a still shot of a, of a you know, progressive uh, showing they start in in spring showing how things are changing and you can go on their website and look in Florida, you'll start to see it and then it creeps up and through um, the Appalachian Mountains all the way to Maine. So it's really a great way. This is a forecasting site where they're using last year's data and then the earliest data to forecast what's going to happen in later parts of the season. Um, and then this is a different type of graph which shows um, how um, how er much earlier or later on average the observations that we're seeing in a year are compared to the national average for, or the long-term average for that site. So um, in West Virginia, for example, in, in 2018, they were having a much earlier spring on average, um, almost 20 days earlier. So this red is, is on the earlier side, while in the same year in Louisiana, they were having a late spring. And so it's a really interesting way to look at this because it shows that even in a single year, you can have dramatically different effects in different parts of the country depending on um, what the weather is like and the weather patterns in a certain part of the country. So our last example is um, uh, for, for species that depend on one another like monarchs and milkweed, what would happen if one species changed in response to climate and another did not? So for example, you can plot um, the timing of milkweed together with the monarchs. And so here with the blue, we're showing when milkweed flowers are open and so um, when, when you have active adults um, in the yellow. And so of course the active adults can feed on things like zinnias. Um, and so it's okay if those two circles diverge. In this year, all of the um, open flowers occurred while we had monarchs around, which was great. But you could imagine if you had a year that shifted for the, for the adult butterflies, that would be okay. Um, but for the, if you had, um, caterpillars around when the milkweed wasn't, that would be a problem. And so for the next graph, I can show you the yellow in this one is this rise here is when we're observing active caterpillar, monarch caterpillars. And this graph is showing when you had common milkweed leaves available. And so in this graph, if you had a shift, say for um, the milkweed arriving, starting earlier and then dying out, you could have a, a part of this graph um, where the caterpillars were starving because they didn't have enough milkweed to eat. And so those, we're not seeing that fortunately, and this graph shows that nicely, um, but those are the kinds of things we're watching for with this program over time. 
So partnerships are really what make a program like this happen and um, the dedicated time of all of our volunteers. We have volunteers of all ages all throughout the state, as I said, and in New Hampshire as well, and all of these wonderful organizations whom I already listed um, that we partner with. And I didn't mention yet that we also work closely with schools and educators all over Maine, um, who, some of whom use this program as part of their lessons. So in the next session, um, we're going to start taking questions in just a few moments. Next time, we'll kind of go through how we observe. And then in the third session, we'll go through how to use our database. Um, but really, citizen science is the only way these data can be collected in such large numbers and over such a wide geographic area. And so we're incredibly grateful for the time um, that our volunteers spend on the program. But we also find it really fun and fulfilling ourselves. Esperanza and I both observe ourselves. And I would love to see this someday, um, a ruby-throated hummingbird feeding its baby on its, its babies on its nest. I haven't yet, but I do observe hummingbirds in my yard. And it's really, it brings me joy. It's climate change can be a heavy topic to think about, but this is one way that um, um, citizens of all ages can really provide incredibly useful data to researchers and resource managers. Um, so with that, I am going to transition over to Esperanza, who is going to um, manage any questions that you might have. Um, and these are our email addresses for follow up or if you have questions, but we will, we will also follow up this with an email with that same information. So over to you, Esperanza. Um, thank you, Beth. It was great. Um, so um, there aren't any questions in the chat box. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, I I don't know if people still have a question. If you'd like to uh, type a question in the chat box, or if um, you know, we might be able to also unmute you so you could ask a question. Oh, okay. We have one here. Um, so, will the slides be available soon? Yes, we're going to be um, taking the recording that we're making um, today and, and for each of them and putting them on our website. So, we'll also uh, send that linkage out to you all, um, as well as the other volunteers who could not make it today or, or interested volunteers. So, definitely we'll be making that available as soon as we can. Okay. Oh, what's the app called? Um, I, Nature's Notebook, right? Yeah. Yes, it's called Nature's Notebook, um, and it's a little picture of a goldfinch, um, and right. it's free. And if you if you want to get you know check it out, it's on the National Phenology Network website, um, and you can download it for Apple and Android. Um, they have they have it for everything. Yeah. Okay, here's a few questions coming in. Um, so is there any indication that commercial crops such as blueberries are being affected? Well, blueberries are a really interesting case and I will defer to any horticulturists who may be among our audience um, for more detailed information, but I know that we truck bees into Maine, um, honeybees, um, to pollinate the blueberries and without them, our blueberry crop crops would be very vulnerable. And so that's part of the reason why this um, colony sickness um, that bees can get from a, I believe it's a fungus, um, is really distressing for all kinds of agricultural production across the country. And so the timing of the phenology for bees is for commercial blueberries is a little less um, variable because of the way that they 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 move the bees around physically um, to help pollinate crops. Um, but for for natural um, wild blueberries, for example, that it that can be an issue from year to year. Some of the times you get a good crop or a poor crop because of the pollination. If it's a very wet um, time, right in the middle of peak flowering, sometimes you get lower pollination for that reason. So another question is what data can be accessed? Is it all public? Can we only see ours, et cetera? And that's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. It's all public and you can download your own data and work with it. And you can also, um, there are some great visualization tools that we can you know, show briefly. 
in our presentation um, on Thursday. Um, but you can work with your own data online. You can download it. You can also download any other data that's in the entire database. And so the database includes hundreds of other species in addition to the ones that we've worked with climate scientists to identify for our own studies here in Maine. But there are many hundreds of other species all across the country. Um, so if you have an interest in any other species and the timing of other types of um, plants and animals in other parts of the country, it will all be there and available. Um, are we assigned an area or just record the area where we happen to be in? Um, do you want me to answer some of these? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll maybe okay. the next one. So um, we'll go over this in the next one, but you, you would select your own site. And so for me, for example, I have four different sites all within my own yard. Um, and so I, I observe the plants that are on our list that are in that site, but I also observe um, some of the animals that are on that list. For example, one of my sites is a vernal pool. And so I look for our amphibian species there. Um, but I also see the this, this species in some of my other sites as well. But everyone would select as many sites or as few um, and in whatever area is most convenient to observe. So if you have a park that you can easily go and observe, that would be a great place to observe, but um, a yard or a schoolyard, if you're an educator, um, works just as well. I work in a school system. Which grade levels do you work with? We have worked with um, all different grade levels. Um, and of course you would adapt it differently for different, different ages. We have a number of of middle school and high school teachers who work with us. And so it really depends um, on how they want to incorporate it into the curriculum. In some places it's um, used as kind of an independent project where a group of students will monitor their own site and then they can compare their observations with other students or with data that's in the database from other parts of the country. Um, and in some places the whole class will observe a single site um, as part of a, a unit about ecology or, or life cycles, for example. Um, so it can really be adapted to different ages. We have produced a number of lessons which are on our website, um, which can be sort of a guide, but we'd be happy to talk um, with any of you about how to make it work in your own situation. Um, I've noticed that bumblebees have been used on some blueberry fields. Are they as effective as honeybees? That is, that is something I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to just say I don't know about that. But I do love both bunny, humble, <laughs> humblebees and bunnybees. <laughs> <laughs> bumblebees and honeybees. But I, I, I would have to look that up and get back to you on that question. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in except for thank yous. <laughs> okay. Nope. So hopefully um, you're already signed up and we'll be able to um, be on our next session too which is coming up, as Beth said, at 3 p.m. on Thursday. Oh, here's another one. Um, does everyone observe all the species in their site? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so I, I just have selected the species that are on the list. I selected from my sites, for example, all the species that are on the list in my site. Um, that can be as many as six or seven species in any given site but it's absolutely up to you. Some people just observe a single species in a single site and they do it routinely over time. And so that's what they wanna do. It really depends on what you feel like you have time for. I guess I would recommend starting with a few and then if you feel like you have time and energy to do more, once you get them set up, it's pretty quick just to click through um, an additional species, but it's always good to just start with a few and, and get used to it and then add them. So you can do it either way. Great. Um, so there isn't any equipment needed for the program. Um, it's just making observations. You might, if you have binoculars and you have tall trees, like, and you want to do red maples or sugar maples, then you would, uh, you know, uh, binoculars would be helpful, but it's not, it's not necessary for most species. Um, so 
no, there really isn't any equipment needed. We provide you with um, the information to make the observations and the training, obviously, for putting submitting those online. Is that list of species to be observed online? Yes. <laughs> sure, I can actually just show you very quickly. Um, for those of you who are interested, I will show you our website and where they are. Um, this is our website um, for the Signs of the Seasons program <clears throat> and the indicator species are here. Um, and each species, so it shows all of our species and I'll click on the common loon just to show you very quickly. Each species, we have a fact sheet, um, the phenophage definitions, which is what you're looking for. So the downy chicks or the fledged young, for example, um, uh, those are downloadable. Um, and then a data sheet PDF from the national website. So we have those there. So we also have webinars of some of our species uh, that um, experts have, uh, have done for us that we've, we've featured. Uh, those are also on our website. There's quite a bit of great information on the website, um, and I highly recommend um, checking it out. Okay. I don't see any other questions at this time. Well, I want to thank all of you for your time. Um, especially later in the day. And um, we're hoping that you'll all join us again um, on Wednesday evening and Thursday, or Wednesday afternoon and Thursday afternoon at three for the Thursday. next two sessions. Sorry, it's Thursday wrong. and Friday. I'm sorry, thir Thursday and Friday. Aha, Thursday and Friday, sorry about that. Yes, thank you all very much for participating. We'll look forward to working with you. Thanks very much. I hope you have all, all have a really nice evening.